of order. Good afternoon. I want to thank Ranking Member Kennedy, our other colleagues, and our witnesses who will be joining us today for this hearing. Today we are 48 days away from the election. That is just 48 days until voters decide the direction our country will take next year on abortion, housing, and taxes. So today's Economic Policy Subcommittee hearing on the macroeconomic impact of potential tax reform in 2025 may sound a little wonky, but the reality is Congress is going to confront huge decisions on tax policy next year. Whether we want to rewrite the tax code or not, 2025 will be a crucial year for setting tax policy because in 2017, Donald Trump and congressional Republicans passed a $2 trillion tax giveaway to the wealthy and big businesses. The Republican tax giveaway was so big that they tried to hide the full cost. So they set up a bunch of pieces to expire at the end of 2025 and hoped that a subsequent Congress would just rubber stamp an extension without noticing how much money rich people and giant corporations would be getting. Next year, Congress will answer the questions we are discussing today about what the tax code should look like. What we decide will affect every American and every part of the economy and every part of the country over the next few decades. Whatever you care about, taxes matter. The tax code determines how much money our nation has for programs like Social Security, Medicare, roads and housing, health care, and child care. And the fine print of the tax code shapes our economy. Will the tax code incentivize billionaires to hoard their money, corporations to grow into titanic monopolies, and multinationals to ship jobs overseas? Or will it create good jobs and new opportunities for small businesses and entrepreneurs right here in the United States? Taxes reflect our values. They show us what and who we value enough to collectively invest in. For decades, particularly since the days of Ronald Reagan and his corporate friendly advisors, the tax system has reflected the values of well-connected billionaires. The 2017 Republican tax cuts centered on a $1.3 trillion tax cut for giant corporations. In the years since then, corporations have raked in record profits, including by price gouging consumers, but they have paid less in taxes. In fact, over the past half century, giant corporations have begun to dominate our economy. Corporate profits as a share of the economy have doubled since the 1950s. Meanwhile, corporate federal income taxes as a share of GDP have fallen by half. Under President Biden and Vice President Harris, things have gotten a little better. We raised taxes on billion dollar corporations for the first time in 30 years, thanks to my 15% corporate minimum tax. We funded the IRS, which has since clawed back over a billion dollars and counting from wealthy tax cheats. But it has been an uphill battle. These improvements to the tax system came with the slimmest of majorities and were opposed by every single Republican member of Congress, House and Senate. And believe me, billionaires and big corporations have fought like hell to beat back bigger reforms. Now, next year, they will fight even harder. Lobbyists have already started calling 2025 the year of tax Super Bowl. These lobbyists are salivating over the hours they can bill their corporate clients and the goodies they can win. But it's not a game, and the outcome is not a foregone conclusion. In fact, I see 2025 as a big opportunity to fix our tax code. So here is the choice that Congress will face. 
and that this subcommittee meets to discuss today. Will we allow Donald Trump and the Republicans to implement their Project 2025 plan to cut taxes even more for billionaires and giant corporations while raising taxes on everyone else? Or will we move the corporate tax rate back up, stitch up the tax loopholes that billionaires wiggle through, and then use that revenue to lower costs for ordinary Americans from housing to childcare? And just as importantly, will we finally say enough is enough, that the rich and the powerful have already fed at the trough long enough and that it is time for them to pay a fair share? Will we have the courage to say that it is better to let the Trump tax cuts expire than to sign on to another multi-trillion dollar giveaway to America's billionaires? I appreciate our panelists joining us for this hearing and sharing their expertise. We have big questions that will come before the Senate and the American public in the coming months, and I am pleased to have the chance to start that conversation today. At this point, I would ordinarily turn to Ranking Member Kennedy, who was right behind you. He's voting, He's voting and then he will be here uh, for his opening remarks. So how about if instead of doing that, we start with our witnesses? We have two great witnesses to share their views on the impact of tax reform on our economy. And I appreciate both of you being here today. First, we have Ai-jin Poo, who is the president of the National Domestic Workers Alliance and the executive director of Caring Across Generations. Ms. Poo is a tireless advocate for caregivers and a nationally recognized expert on elder and family care, the future of work, gender equality, and grassroots organizing. And second, we have Kitty Richards, who is an expert in tax and physical policy with Groundwork Collaborative. She also served in the Treasury Department during the Biden-Harris administration and as an economic policy advisor in the White House to then Vice President Biden. So thank you both for being here today, and I look forward to hearing your testimony. Ms. Pooh, how about if we start with you? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I'm so honored to be here to speak with you today, and also grateful to Ranking Member Kennedy and members of the committee for having me for the opportunity to testify to the economic impacts of potential tax reform. Again, my name is Ai Jen Pu, and I'm the president of the National Domestic Workers Alliance and executive director of Caring Across Generations. We are part of Care Can't Wait, a national coalition working to lower the cost of caring for families and improve the quality of work for our nation's care workforce. Every day in America, 10,000 babies are born, and 10,000 of us turn 65. More of us are living longer, which means the number of older adults in America over the age of 85 is expected to more than double by the year 2040. And this is a beautiful thing because it means more time to live and to learn and to contribute to watch our children and our grandchildren grow. But it also means that we are a nation in need of more care more than ever before. And in America today, only the wealthy can afford it. We live in one of the only countries in the world without guaranteed paid family and medical leave, which means that one in four moms returns to work within two weeks of giving birth. In every state in America, center-based childcare for two kids costs more than rent. A room in a nursing home will run you $100,000 per year. And then while aging and dis if you want to receive aging and disability care in the home where most people want to receive it, it can cost anywhere from $60,000 to $288,000 per year. Meanwhile, the median income of a home care worker in America 
is less than $22,000 per year. The workers whose profession it is to help care for us can't care for their own families on the wages they earn. They also happen to be the fastest growing occupation in our entire workforce because of the tremendous need. Deciding how we spend public dollars using the federal tax code is one of the most powerful tools we have to lower costs for everyday middle class families. It reflects what we understand to be shared priorities and essential infrastructure for a strong economy. Just as we must invest in physical infrastructure like bridges and tunnels, we need care infrastructure. As Senator Bob Casey famously said, some people need a bridge or a tunnel to get to work and others need childcare, others need home care. Without these investments, tens of millions of working family caregivers and parents are making impossible choices between caring for their loved ones and working to pay the bills. Untold numbers of us are pushed into debt and poverty, while the majority of our 9 million professional care workers are trapped in working poverty. The 2017 tax law decreased federal revenue by trillions while doing almost nothing to address the fundamental needs of working and middle class families. Under the law, the wealthiest 1% of households can expect an average benefit of $60,000 in 2025, while the majority, including most family caregivers, disabled people, seniors, and parents will receive less than 500. That's $40 a month. And care workers will average even less, $70 per year. These tax cuts benefited the people with the least need the most. While the vast majority of us continue to struggle. I recently traveled across the country to meet caregivers. And in Atlanta, I met Martreza a sandwich generation caregiver caring for her chronically ill mother at home and a young daughter at the same time. She found a strange spot on her skin, but because she couldn't afford care assistance, she prioritized care for her family over her own. And the day before I met her in Atlanta, she was diagnosed with advanced stage cancer. Our tax policy cannot continue to deepen the inequality of care in America. Rather, it should help address it, and it can. We must raise revenue and make investments in our care systems from childcare to paid family and medical leave to senior and disability care. I urge you to let the 2017 tax cuts for the wealthiest expire and use additional revenue to invest in the care we all need. 2025 is our once in a generation moment to ensure that the wealthy pay their fair share so that we can all contribute to a strong economy and care for our families too. I look forward to your questions, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Poop. Ms. Richards. committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. Again, my name is Kitty Richards. I'm a senior fellow at the Groundwork Collaborative, an economic policy think tank based here in Washington, D.C., and I'm grateful to the committee for holding this hearing about the really important macroeconomic impacts of tax reform in 2025. As you know, next year is going to be a big year for tax policy making as the individual income tax provisions of the 2017 tax law expire. But I want to talk about more than the TCJA, and especially more than just its expiring provisions. I want to talk about how to support a thriving economy through tax reform. And to do that, we really need to do three things. First, tax reform must raise substantial new revenue well above the revenue lost to the failed 2017 Tax Act. Before the Bush tax cuts, and then their extension, and then the 2017 law, the U.S. had a tax system that was not perfect, but raised enough revenue to support a fully functioning government and did it progressively. We need revenue to support a 21st century government that can restore a strong, secure middle class 
build our clean energy future, and ensure that every American can participate in the economy and reach their full potential. I'm honored to be sitting next to Ai-jen Poo, who can speak to the importance of investments in care infrastructure much more eloquently than I can and just did. Second, tax reform must directly redress the skyrocketing inequality that has characterized the American economic experience over the past 50 years. And we have to pay special attention to the persistent racial and gender disparities in wages, wealth, and opportunity that not only harm those communities, but really hold our economy back. This inequality is not just profoundly unfair and damaging to the welfare of the large majority of Americans who have been left behind. It also has a negative impact on economic growth through multiple channels. Third, Tax reform must rebalance economic power away from the wealthy and corporations, putting a break on extractive practices at the high end that weaken economic performance while enriching shareholders, executives, and highly compensated professionals at the expense of everyone else, and enhancing the economic power and participation of low and middle income workers, especially those who currently provide the more than $1 trillion in unpaid care work each year that allows all other work to happen. My written testimony outlines a number of ways that tax reform in 2025 can accomplish these goals, and I'd like to just go through a few of them here. Congress should restore the corporate tax to a major source of progressive revenue for the US government and ensure that it functions as a break on corporate power and corporate profiteering, not an accelerant. This can be accomplished by raising the corporate tax rate including raising it back to 35% where it was before the 2017 tax law for the most profitable corporations, closing corporate loopholes, and eliminating current preferences for foreign source income over American source income. The US should also move swiftly to implement the once in a century agreement among more than 130 countries across the world to prevent corporations from forcing a global race to the bottom in corporate taxation. Doing so will increase US tax revenues and reduce large multinationals' ability to siphon profits offshore. Congress should restore the top tax rates on high incomes and address the many special tax giveaways that provide outsized benefits to the richest taxpayers, including some introduced in the TCJA, like the Section 199A deduction. On the other end of the individual tax, Congress should restore the enhanced child tax credit from the American Rescue Plan, which cut child poverty in half before it was allowed to expire, and expand on the success of the earned income tax credit by making more workers eligible for a larger sum. And finally, Congress must reform the way that income from wealth is taxed. Taxing wealth-like work is more than a fairness issue. It is absolutely crucial to ensuring that the richest taxpayers pay any tax at all, let alone their fair share, and to rebalancing power in the economy. Proposals like Senator Wyden's billionaire's income tax or the Biden-Harris administration's billionaire's minimum income tax are a hugely important part of building a tax system that works for workers and builds our economy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Richards. Uh, and now we're gonna start our questions with the Senator from New Jersey, Senator Helmy. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, participate in this hearing. And, and uh, I note and thank you for your long lasting and standing uh, leadership on tax policy issues that break apart what I call the consolidation of opportunity uh, in this nation and uh, invest in opportunities that uh, lift up uh, low and income and growing middle class. But thank you both for, uh, for being here. Uh, and uh, Ms. Poo, I'm sorry I missed your uh, opening remarks, but I did have a chance to uh, read them and, and we'll uh, hopefully give you an opportunity to uh, to build on on uh, some of the interesting points I read. Ms. Richards, if I can uh, start with you, uh, I'd like to discard, discuss investments in education. And I would start by saying, um, you know, the Pell Grant um, has had a significant impact on low-income and middle-income New Jerseyans. In New Jersey, approximately 35% of undergraduate students relied on Pell in 21-22 academic year, as would be expected most of those recipients coming from low-income households. Would you mind speaking with some specificity to the return on investment we see when we make investments in uplifting low-income uh, families by investing in educational opportunities for them and what that might mean for growing our U.S. economy? Uh, absolutely. 
investing in the human capital of future workers, current workers, and innovators in our economy is one of the most important things that we can do to increase productivity growth, increase wages, and build a really strong, resilient economy that can work for you know, the next 100 years. And Pell Grants are such a great example of how we can do that. When it, researchers at the OECD have found that one of the major mechanisms by which growing inequality is stifling growth across the world and especially in the United States is the failure of these economies to be able to invest in the bottom half of the income distribution and in their human capital. And when you give a Pell Grant to someone who otherwise wouldn't be able to go to college, you are opening up a world of possibility for them and for them to be able to participate fully in the economy and become a future leader, a strong worker, and also deliver for their family. Uh, I would just note personally, Chair, my wife who immigrated from Egypt when she was 10 was a recipient of federal dollars to go to our undergraduate at Rutgers. And my children have more opportunities than we had as kids because, as you said, Ms. Richards, that opportunity and investment in, um, um, in low and middle income families uh, like the ones we came from. Uh, if I can stay with you, Ms. Richard, I, I would just, uh, you mentioned in your written testimony the investments in child care. And according to census data, over a million of our children in New Jersey benefited from the expanded credit in 2021. Under the current law, of course, an estimated 19 million children under 17 receive less than a full credit or no credit at all because the family's incomes are too low. If we were able to restore the CTC to the, to the restored amount of the American Rescue Plan, how do you see that in also helping the economics broadly, again, of the U.S. economy, but specifically the economics of low- and middle-income families? The child tax credit expansion included in the COVID recovery package was a phenomenal success. It drove child poverty to a record low of 5.2% in 2021, which, by the way, it's a shame that we live in the richest country on earth and 5.2% 5 of our children living in poverty is a record low, but it was incredibly successful. If the program had been extended, 3 million fewer children would have been living in poverty in 2022. It really makes clear that hungry children and families trapped in poverty, those are policy choices. But as you said, it also really stifles our economy. Those children we have reams of evidence to show that getting high quality care, having a stable environment with a roof over your head where you're not at risk of eviction or homelessness, having food in your stomach when you go to school, these are huge determinants of your future economic success and the economic success of our society. And I would also love to add the CTC is so important, but investments in child care have a return on investment as high as 12 to one. And you know these things, I'd love to turn it over to my colleague because um, these things are about more than just family economic well, security. It's a, it's a perfect segue and they don't allow junior senators to go over their time. So uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, in, uh, uh, this is a great segue, Ms. Poo, if I may. In, in 2022, a study by researchers at Joint Committee of Taxation and the Federal Reserve Board analyzed the impact of the TCJA, the Trump tax bill and in corporate returns, shareholder data, and worker earnings, and I quote, the earnings do not change for workers in the bottom 90% of within firm distribution. But as you would expect, that's my ad lib, back to the quote, but do increase for workers in the top 10% increase, particularly sharply for firm managers and executives. What I would ask you, if we were able to take the corporate tax rate back up to a 28%, which is what is being proposed by some on, on this side of the dais, um, how do you see that being impactful to the care economy, and again, to the same way I phrase the question to Ms. Richards, how would we reinvest that in the care economy, and what would that mean to uplifting low and middle income families, uh, and again, the broader investment in the American economy? Well, I think we have so, thank you for the question, Senator. I think we have so underinvested in low income and middle income families in our country that we can't do enough at this point to support them. Um, I think that the child tax credit is incredibly important as a way to offer relief for lower income families in particular, and we've seen the impact of that. And I think investments in the care infrastructure are long overdue and essential. And there's an economist at Harvard named Larry Katz who calls investments in the care economy triple dignity investments. Because if you think about our ability to invest in, say, the child care workforce and making those poverty wage jobs better jobs, those 
wage increases not only benefit those workers and their families and communities, but then they enable through the services they provide to support millions of other working families and uh, caregivers and working parents to go to work and participate in the economy. And then they support the next generation of children to be able to have access to quality care at these crucial years of their lifetime. And older adults, people with disabilities, having the ability to live dignified full lives as they age. This kind of return on investment is exponential and these investments are long overdue. Uh, I appreciate both of you being here. I appreciate your qualitative analysis in your um, written testimony on the unpaid and um, uncredited work uh, that comes out of the care economy. And I turn it back to the chair with tremendous gratitude for her leadership on these issues. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for those very thoughtful questions. So let's talk more about the tax bill that passed in 2017. Donald Trump signed into law in 2017 his only big legislative accomplishment, a $2 trillion tax giveaway for the wealthy and the well-connected. And now he is out there promising to shovel even more tax breaks to, quote, these are his words, his rich as hell donors. But the American people want to move forward, not backward. 80% of voters want to raise taxes on the rich, and Democrats have a proposal to do exactly that. Those higher taxes on the rich would give our nation revenue, money, to build 3 million new homes and lower rents by 10%, money to cut the cost of childcare to just $10 a day for most families, money to build a better future for everyone. So let's talk about the 2017 tax law and the choice that the next president, the next Congress will face as a big chunk of it starts to expire. Ms. Poop, you worked on behalf of the two and a half million nannies, house cleaners, and home care workers who keep American families going, keep them in the workplace. What was the impact of the 2017 Trump tax cuts on the domestic workers that you represent? How big a slice of that $2 trillion did they get? Madam Chair, the short answer is next to nothing. This, if the Trump era tax cuts were allowed to continue, the average care worker, like our members, would receive $70 per year in benefit, which is in contrast to the richest 1% who would receive $60,000 per year. And by the way, the majority of American workers in this country earn less than $60,000 per year. So talk about exacerbating what is already brutal inequality in our economy and feeding the epidemic of low wage work that we have to address. We cannot allow for our tax policy to leave essential workers like care workers and other low wage workers behind. All right. So that's the calculation based on what we've seen. But Donald Trump is doubling down. He's proposing $7 trillion in further tax cuts, including slashing the corporate rate on down to just 15%. That's not all. In their Project 2025 playbook, Republicans in Washington have laid out a scheme to further shift the tax burden from the wealthy to the middle class and working class in order to fund one and a half to $2.4 million tax cut for households making more than $10 million a year. The Republicans have laid out their Project 2025 plan to raise taxes by an average of $3,000 for the median family of four. Now, Ms. Richards, you're a former White House and Treasury Department official. You are an expert in tax and economic policy. So tell us, what impact would these proposals that Donald Trump and Project 2025 uh, have already put on the table, what impact would these proposals have 
overall on our economy? The, the impact would be higher inflation, higher interest rates, weaker economic growth, and recession becomes a serious threat again. Those are direct quotes from an analysis put out last month by Moody's Analytics after reviewing GOP plans to extend the expiring 2017 provisions for wealthy individuals, further cut the corporate tax rate, and impose tariffs that would drive up costs for low- and middle-income families. But as you noted in your remarks, many of former President Trump's closest allies are envisioning an even more extreme tax agenda. Project 2025 would get rid of our current progressive income tax system, along with nearly all of the deductions and credits that lower taxes for low and middle income families, and significantly increase the income tax rate that those families pay. Then those savings would get funneled into cutting taxes for the wealthiest households at the very top. Experts ran the numbers recently and found that this would increase taxes by $3,000 for the typical family of four, while giving between $1.5 and $2.4 million in annual tax cuts for those wealthiest households with more than $10 million. So we're really talking about an income redistribution scheme here, right? From the wealthiest 10,000 families in America, um, that they get an average of how much more? Uh, 1.5 to 2.4 million dollars. It's hard to nail down. Per family. Per family. For the wealthiest 10,000 and for middle class, working class America, they lay out how much more? Uh, $3,000 for the typical family of four. So this is amazing. You know, I listened to the Republicans rail about wealth redistribution. Let's face it, wealth redistribution is happening. Mm -hmm. And what Donald Trump wants to see, along with his Republican friends, is let's redistribute even more wealth from the tiny fraction of the very richest Americans, and let's make working families, let's make middle class families pay more. So this is going to be, did I say that as wealth leaves them? It's more wealth from middle class America up to the richest among us. You know, um, and, and as you rightly say, this is what the economists at Moody's are telling us. They've already taken a look at this. You can exactly track. And Project 2025 has actually laid out the numbers. We don't even have to sit here and do the math ourselves. They are so extremist that they think they can tell America what they plan to do and that somehow the United States is still going to go along with it, that voters are going to go along with it. I do understand why Donald Trump is trying to back off from Project 2025, but these are his advisors. This is his Republican Party who is advancing this, and we are heading into a big tax fight in which the Republicans are proposing to take wealth away from working families and give more wealth to rich families and to do it all through the tax code. So look, it's pretty outrageous. Uh, it is better to walk away and let the Trump tax cuts expire than to sign our names to that kind of a wealth transfer to help multimillionaires and billionaires at the expense of working families. But that doesn't have to be where our 2025 tax fight ends. I believe we can do better than that. We can raise taxes on the rich. We can invest in lowering costs for American families. And that is exactly what Vice President Harris has proposed, raising revenue by taking the corporate tax rate, she's just saying take it back up to 28%, and impose a 25% minimum tax on these mega millionaires and billionaires and use that money to help families with the cost of housing and childcare. Now, Ms. Richards, let's do the comparison here. We talked about Donald Trump's plan is to take money away from middle class and working families and give it to the very wealthy. Vice President Harris's plan is take some of this money away from the wealthy and give it back to middle class and working families in the form of providing the infrastructure for child care and housing and reduce those costs. So can you describe overall what impact Vice President Harris's proposals would have on our economy? 
Sure. I think it's worth coming back to the same Moody's analysis that I spoke of earlier. Their economists conclude that enacting Vice President Harris's policies would lead to strong economic growth and lower, growth. lower inflation, full employment, and critically, Harris's policies would boost the finances of lower and middle income Americans. Again, direct quotes. For the record, Moody's also concludes that debt as a share of GDP would be far better under Vice President Harris's proposals because of how costly the GOP tax cuts are and because of the revenue raising proposals you just mentioned. And you can also think of that as an indication of how much more we could have to invest in care economy and the workers that really power economic growth in this country. So very interesting point because you're really saying the effect overall on the economy of the Trump tax cuts would be a disaster, right? Higher inflation, lower GDP growth, lower job growth. But as a side benefit, the other consequence of this would be to drive up the deficit. And that we see exactly the inverse in the way that Vice President Harris wants to do this by saying higher taxes on those at the top and more investment in bringing down costs for those in the middle. You know, the next president and Congress will face huge decisions on tax policy. Donald Trump wants to make an America that works even better for those at the top. Kamala Harris and congressional Democrats want to tax the rich so that we can build a stronger, fairer America. An America where Jeff Bezos doesn't pay a lower tax rate than a public school teacher. That's the America we're working for. An America where everyone can get ahead, where childcare costs and health care bills are not crushing families, and an America where every family can afford a home. That's an America worth fighting for, and that is the battle we will be in in 2025. With that, I will call on the Senator from Maryland, Senator Van Hollen, for his questions. Well, thank you, Senator Warren. And as I said before the hearing, I had a, another uh, briefing I was at, so I'm glad, uh, glad to make it. Thank you for pulling this great panel uh, together. Thank both of you for being here. And I, I know Senator Warren and others have, have laid out some of the vice president's uh, plans, uh, which would be to really uh, invest uh, in the middle class and those working uh, to become part of the middle class. So I think as we listen to uh, our Republican colleagues and we get a preview of what Republican claims are about what their tax policies would do, it's important to go back and rewind the tape a little bit um, and see what claims were made uh, about the last round uh, of Trump tax cuts, which were really, as we all know, for the very wealthy. But I think Having two experts here, we can dissect some of the claims they made and whether they ever really came true. Um, as we know, the, the Trump tax uh, cuts took the corporate rate from 35% to 21%. Um, we now raise about 1.8% of uh, our GDP from big corporations and others, which is a very small amount uh, given the magnitude uh, of those profits. Uh, and now Republicans are planning to cut the corporate tax even further. 18% um, says former President Trump, um, I'm sorry, Project 2025, President Trump is saying in some categories, maybe even go to 15%. Uh, so in 2017, we were told that these big corporate tax cuts um, would cause such massive economic growth that they would pay for themselves. So let me just start with a straightforward question. Did they pay for themselves? No. no. That was laughable at the time, and it has not worn well. Yeah. Is who? Agree. Okay. So one of the other things they claimed was that those cuts were going to generate a big new wave of investments, right? That corporations would take their tax savings and invest them into growing uh, their businesses. So Ms. Richards, did business investment shoot up in the two years following the tax cuts when corporations first felt the effect of those cuts and before COVID may have distorted the data? Nope. Right? It's, again, just no ambiguity here. It just didn't 
happen. And in fact, what we saw was corporations spent $806 billion in stock buybacks in 2018, paying off wealthy investors instead of growing their businesses. Another claim that was made uh, was that corporations would use some of that tax savings to increase the wages they paid uh, to their employees. In fact, Kevin Hassett, who was the head of Trump's Council of Economic Advisors, said there would be, and I quote, an immediate jump in wage growth, end of quote. And former president predicted an average wage increase of $4,000 tied directly to those uh, tax cuts. So Ms. Richards, um, did the average American get a $4,000 raise from the Trump tax cuts? No. In fact, median wage growth actually slowed in 2018 and 2019 after the Trump tax cuts were enacted. Right. And, you know, the only people who saw raises were the very wealthy executives uh, who got about $50,000 on average uh, boost uh, in their in their income. So, Ms. Pooh, did the people who were caring for our children and aging uh, members of our communities uh, get a $50,000 raise? No, Senator. The median annual income for a home care worker is $22,000 per year in the United States. And, and when those companies were making billions of dollars in more profits um, and using a lot of their profits for stock buybacks, did they at least uh, lower prices for consumers? No, Senator, prices have gone up. Yeah. So prices went up, wages did not go up, stock buybacks and executive compensation went up, um, the deficit went up, um, and these guys wanna run that movie yeah. again. Uh, so I appreciate both of you being here just to refresh our memories a little bit um, beyond the sloganeering as to what actually happened in the real world. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Van Hollen. I always appreciate your questions. But on this one, just walking through, what were the promises made in 2017 and what did the data show? Because that same set of promises will right. be made in 2025 as we go through these tax fights. And what's the old, burn me once, shame on you, burn me twice, right. shame on me. We're not falling for that again. So thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate the questions. You. If you'll bear with me, I've got another round of questions I'd like to be able to ask. You know, for too long, Republicans have raced to cut taxes for the wealthy, and then they turn around and slash funding for critical programs mm -hmm. that many Americans rely on. The tax fight next year will determine how much money we have to help lower costs for families by making the investments in childcare and housing, and whether millionaires and billionaires chip in like everyone else. So let's focus for a minute on childcare. While other nations have invested in universal, affordable, high quality care for their children, we have stayed stuck in a debate over how much to cut taxes. The result, the United States now ranks 31st out of 38 developed countries mm. in terms of tax revenue as a share of GDP, and 33rd out of 37 of the richest nations for their spending on child care. Child care, as you noted in your testimony, is more expensive than rent for the average family in America. And I just want to add a footnote to that, if they can find it at all. Correct. Because part of what never goes into that calculation are all the people who just give up, all the people who can't find it at all, or who are using under the table ways of having their children taken care of uh, that never show up in these statistics. So, Ms. Pooh, why is it so difficult for families to find affordable, high-quality childcare? Why doesn't this market work? Why don't we just put a little more money into people's hands and suddenly we will have a functioning childcare market? The system is broken because we've never invested in building it. We don't have a functioning childcare system in the United States. Right now, there are fixed costs associated with delivering safe, 
quality childcare. And childcare currently relies on a patchwork system of federal and state dollars that is anemic and inconsistent at best. And in that context, the cost gets passed on to individual families who are struggling and also the care workforce. So you have families paying enormous amounts, up to 30% of their income, and workers earning, for po earning poverty wages to stay in this work, to keep the doors open of these facilities. And it is unsustainable for everyone involved the average childcare worker earns less than $30,000 per year. You know, I, I, you caught me with the line, why is the childcare system broken? Because we never built it. I'm reminded as you say this, that I nearly got derailed from the lack of available, affordable childcare. Not once, but twice. Just almost got knocked completely off and was saved because I had an elderly Aunt B who came to live with me for 16 years in order to see me through all of my childcare needs for all those years. What is so frustrating to me is it was hard for me when there were fewer women in the workforce, when we were kind of felt like the first wave of mamas going into the workforce. It was just as hard for my daughter and now it appears it is going to be just as hard for my granddaughters because we continue not to make this investment. The idea that a family can take out of its own income to pay for an entire childcare infrastructure is just nuts. We don't ask families to go pay for all of the costs of second grade. We say that we all pitch in so that we can afford to build an education system K through 12 and make that available for all of our kids, but we're not doing it on childcare and families, babies and childcare workers are the ones who are paying the price for this. But it takes money to make this system work and look at the billionaires right now. They're just not paying taxes. Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos want to keep sitting on their growing piles of wealth protected by armies of lawyers and accountants and wealth managers and lobbyists who ensure that the money they make doesn't count as taxable income. Ms. Poo, tell me, is that option of just deciding not to pay taxes and build your wealth out and to live on it knowing you would be protected by an army of accountants and lawyers and lobbyists available for our child care workers? Are they, are they doing the same thing there? No, Madam Senator. If they were, I would not be here testifying <laughs> today. <laughs> you know, is it available to middle class families? You know, people who've got two folks in the workforce, they're earning median wages. Is it available to them? It is not. You know, this is the part we have to remember, the extraordinary inequality, not just in outcome, but inequality in opportunity to build something in this country. The top 1% in this country just hit a record $44.6 trillion in wealth. That is almost as much as the bottom 90% of Americans have scraped together but that top 1% is barely paying taxes. And every year that goes by with the wealthiest Americans paying so little is another year in which their grip over our economy grows stronger while everyone else struggles to get by. Donald Trump and congressional Republicans understand this dynamic. And instead of working to reverse it, they are tripping over themselves to promise their wealthy donors even more tax giveaways next year. But President Biden and Vice President Harris have a much better idea. They have a plan to ensure that anyone who is making more than a hundred has more than a hundred million dollars in assets 
And just so you know, this is the top 10,000 richest mega millionaires and billionaires that they pay at least 25% of all the income they make in taxes. That is still far less than the top individual tax rate, but for the first time, it would force the 10,000 richest Americans in America to stop hoarding their wealth for, and hiding it from the IRS. Now, Ms. Richards, if we pass the Biden-Harris billionaire's minimum income tax, affecting just the top one-tenth of one percent of all Americans, and then invest that money in affordable child care for all Americans, what kind of return on our investment would we get? Investments in child care have undeniable payoffs. The return on investment can be as high as 12 to 1. Meanwhile, billionaires sitting on stock for years and years for tax purposes is actually bad for the economy. It makes it less dynamic. It makes us less able to grow and innovate. So the return on investment would be huge. Yeah. So I, I think this is a really important point to make. You know, you could be somebody who just doesn't care about kids, doesn't care about care, but just making a hard-nosed investment decision, investing in billionaires, which is what a system does when it says you can sit on those piles of wealth and not pay taxes on them, doing that has the effect of actually making the economy work less vigorously. They hold on even when they should sell, right? They don't make good investment decisions day to day. They make tax-driven decisions because we have privileged one form of wealth and holding on to that wealth. The difference, of course, is that if we tax that wealth and particularly decided to invest it in a care economy, I think you described it as the consequence could be would be more mamas and daddies can go to work, right. right? And be able to work more productively. More care workers would be paid a wage that lets them support themselves, their families, and their economies. And the third generation or the next generation pay off. And more children would get a better start in life. And this is the reason to say that saying pay taxes here so we can make this investment there is a payoff of about 12 to 1. It makes no sense to pass that up. And that's what's going to be in front of us in this tax fight in 2025. Taxing the ultra wealthy is good for the economy, it's fair, and it's popular. Four out of five Americans support raising taxes on the richest Americans. Democrats, Republicans, independents. And next year, Congress needs to listen to them, not to the billionaires that are trying to fund political campaigns right now. 2025 is an opportunity to reshape the tax code. And we need to be, do more than just be on defense about uh, the Trump tax extensions for the billionaires. We need to be on offense by looking at the whole tax system and saying we can make better investments with our federal dollars. So thank you all for being here. I really appreciate this. You know, thanks to decades of lobbying, the U.S. tax code is stuck in a doom loop. Uh, it is rigged to benefit the richest corporations and the richest people instead of designed to help working families. We have a chance to change that in 2025 and a chance to fight for a tax code that reflects our values. That means investing in middle class and working people. It means making billionaires and big businesses pay their fair share. And it means rejecting bad deals that throw pennies to ordinary Americans while showering the ultra wealthy with even more tax giveaways. Thank you to both of our witnesses for being here today and for providing this testimony. For senators who wish to submit questions for the record, 
Those questions are due one week from today, that's Wednesday, September 25th. For our witnesses, you will then have 45 days to respond to any question. Thank you again, thank you for being here, and with that, this hearing is adjourned.